We are back with Dr. William Lee. He has joined us for a couple videos now. This is video three. And what we really wanna do in this video is get to some very simple, practical advice. Um, we've talked a lot about science and a lot about uh, the work that he's been doing, but I'd really just like to hear from him on some specific recommendations. If you have cancer, uh, where to start as it relates to food. So Dr. Lee, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jameson. Listen, one of the reasons that I went into food as medicine research was because all of the patients that I had who I had diagnosed with cancer always had that question, hey doc, mm. what, I, what should I be eating? Like they would they ask me, how bad is it? What treatment do I need to take? How long do I have? And then the final question, and what should I eat? What should I eat? <laughs> yeah. Uh, almost every single one. And, and I realized I probably had a reasonable answer I could give to almost every single one of those questions, except for the nutrition one, because I, like many doctors had, you know, probably a week's worth of nutrition during my entire medical education. Sure. And uh, so I felt that was wrong. And I went back into, you know, the lab and the clinic to try to figure out the answer. So let me just kind of synthesize uh, some of the foods that I want people to think about. Okay. Perfect. And by the way, I want to preface by saying, I'm not giving medical advice. Um, mm. You really need to be able, there's no magic cure. There's no food that can cure cancer. Um, and, and you have to really work with your oncologist and everybody's body responds differently. But I will tell you what the research shows um, uh, that that's really worth considering because it's so practical. Uh, number one, I think that uh, you should uh, consider drinking green tea. Mm. Green tea have, has catechins, natural polyphenols, that have been shown in virtually every single research study that's ever been done. Can actually lower inflammation, boost your immunity, cut off the blood supply of feeding cancers, and actually help cancer patients also be a little bit more relaxed uh, because it also lowers anxiety and lowers blood pressure. And green tea yeah. is just one of those beverages that um, I think that is um, a winner from almost any angle you can look at. Uh, and if you can't um, have caffeine with it, here's something practical. You can get decaffeinated uh, uh, green tea, but oh, make sure it's decaffeinated with water decaffeination mm. process, not the solvent uh, version. Yeah. Uh, so there are companies that actually tell you that they, they probably tell you that they remove the caffeine using a water process. So that'd be one, one of the, one of the five. I would say uh, another one that people should consider are dark leafy greens. Now it sounds mm. like it might be trite to say that, but I can tell you that there are chemicals that have been identified called sulforaphanes and isothiocyanates that are present in chicory, in broccoli, in broccoli sprouts, in kale, radicchio, you know, and lots of these and anthocyanins. There's lots of these natural chemicals. And in the lab and in the clinic, they actually all have been all been shown to be associated with being able to help fight cancer. Hmm. On top of that, many of these leafy greens have a lot of fiber. And we talked in a past video about dietary fiber feeding your gut microbiome, which then lowers your inflammation, your mi gut microbiome, the bacteria talks to your immune system, which then helps you fight cancer. There's nothing wrong with that. And in today's kind of Google video world, uh, YouTube world, if there's a green that you didn't like because the way your mom cooked it wasn't so great, go ahead and type in that, that dark leafy green, dinosaur kale, you know, radicchio, bok choy, mm -hmm. and search recipe um, and video, and you'll watch somebody like the food channel tell you an amazingly delicious way to make it that can be done in 20 minutes or less kind of thing. So that's the second one, tea and vegetables. Third one. Now, now, now quick question about, yeah. about the leafy greens, um, and maybe other, other ones on your list. How, how important is it in your mind for things to be purchased organic and or local? Uh, and how, where do you kind of rate that for yourself? Yeah. So look, eating, whole foods, plant-based foods, like leafy greens, it's, if you can get them, eat them. Okay. Don't, you know, like you, you want to, you, you don't want to kind of say, well, I can't get organic. Okay. Um, so having them is what's the most important thing. Got now it. you want to take it to the next level. I can actually talk about that. So I used to be a big skeptic about organic. Mm. Okay. Uh, and the reason is I kind of resented the idea that I have to pay more money to get something with less bad stuff <laughs> right yeah it just sounded that seemed wrong to me yeah. um but I, I changed my mind about three years ago 
just before the pandemic. Mm. Um, I learned from a bunch of horticulturalists, people that study plants, that in fact, many of the bioactives that are anti-androgenic, immune boosting, uh, good for the gut microbiome, they're actually produced by the plant for the plant's own defenses, specifically mm. as natural insecticides, natural pest control. So a great example of this is in strawberries. The what, you know, strawberries are sweet and tart, right? And, and the mm -hmm. tart part of a strawberry comes from something called elagic acid. Mm -hmm. Elagic acid is naturally made by the strawberry plant in, as, a, as a natural insecticide, natural pesticide. So when bugs nibble on the strawberries, leaves, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and uh, stems, the strawberry uh, plant feels that as an injury. Got to get rid of those bugs so it makes more elagic acid to repel mm -hmm. those bugs and loads it up in the fruit. Okay? Got it. Yep. So when you buy a organic plant, you actually get, well, what happens is that, so in conventionally grown with pesticides, you have fewer bugs around, right? So the plant looks nicer, fewer bugs, less injury, less mm -hmm. bioactive. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean there's no bioactive, but it's much less compared to um, uh, the strawberry. I can tell you another example is in coffee beans. Organically grown coffee beans have something called chlorogenic acid, which helps to repel insects as well. An organic coffee bean has three times as much chlorogenic acid as wow. one conventional. That's interesting. Sure. Now I have a different point of view because I might be willing to pay a little bit more to get a little bit more good stuff. Yep. Yep. So, so not just get the absence of bad stuff, but you're actually getting more good stuff. Exactly. That's, that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you for, for answering that. Right. Well, so we talked about tea, we talked about leafy greens, mm -hmm. berries, and we started talking mm -hmm. about berries have this elagic acid and anthocyanins, dark berries like blueberries, blackberries, um, uh, and even strawberries. You know, anthocyanin is a kind of a reddish purplish natural dye that is mm -hmm. anti-androgenic immune boosting activity. Uh, and, and eating berries actually is really helpful for your health defenses. So that's a third food that's really practical. By the yep. way, if you have berries, do please don't put tons of sugar on them. Let Mother Nature's sugar, you know, most sure. berries are not that sweet, but you don't want to like, you know, sort of kill the goose that lays the golden egg kind of thing. With the sure. added sugar. Um, uh, so that's the third thing I would actually suggest. And then tree nuts. Now, in a past video, we mm -hmm. talked about the evidence that uh, tree nuts actually um, can be good for um, in a study looking at stage three colon cancer, yeah. which is published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. But I can tell you that other studies have similarly found that tree nuts can have tremendous benefits for um, the gut microbiome, which then helps your immune system fight cancer. Uh, so uh, uh, it's a, nuts are, uh, what, what I love about nuts is that they're, they're, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of nuts, right? Yep. You might like Brazil nuts or pecans or almonds or cashews or macadamias or walnuts. You can switch it out. You're all getting the same thing. Good, healthy, natural plant-based forms of omega-3s and a ton of dietary fibers. These mm -hmm. activate your body's health defense systems in favor. And nuts are, are different than kind of like I eat a piece of salmon, you know, uh, for dinner. Um, uh, you can stack on a nut. And my mm -hmm. only uh, strong suggestion and, and kind of warning is do not snack on nuts that have been deep fried or have right. chemical fire rings put on them. Always look at how it's been processed and how it's actually been seasoned and what's in the seasoning. Better yet, go to the bulk section of the grocery store where you can buy it cheaply anyway. Yeah. Get a bunch of different kinds, you know, the kind you like. Um, take a metal bowl and and go to the spice cabinet, pick out, you know, dried spices that you actually like. Mm -hmm. If you like spicy, bust out the the the, the chili or the smoked paprika. Uh, if you like savory, uh, garlic salt, you know, I mean do it yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know exactly what's in it. So that's really helpful. And then the last one, you know, people might be um, surprised by. Uh, this comes from research I and other people have done is dark chocolate. Turns oh, out interesting. Chocolate is a confection. Like if you get a Milky Way bar or Three Musketeers, I mean, you know, like Halloween candy. All right, that's a confection. It's got mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff and actually not that much real cacao. Stuff. Right. Yeah. But get a bar, which you can find in almost any grocery store now, that's 85, 80% or higher mm -hmm. chocolate, cacao. Now you're talking about essentially something that's mostly plant-based because that's what cacao is. 
It gives yeah. you dietary fiber. It gives you polyphenols from the chocolate. And we've done some research that was presented at the um, uh, American Society of Nutrition's annual meeting that showed that the stuff in dark chocolate can cut off the blood supply feeding cancers. It's an anti ah. uh, And we actually tested with leukemia cells, for example, and it directly is toxic to leukemia cells. It kills leukemia cells. So interesting. All kinds of things that are really interesting about food. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. You asked me to pick yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I know there's a list of 200, uh, but I think those are all some very practical, uh, solid recommendations. So thank you. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the, you know for, for people who actually want to know more about these types of foods, I, uh, you know, I feel like I drink from a fire hydrant every single mm. week. There's so much new information that's coming out. And so what I've tried to do, especially during the pandemic, I realized that, you know, people are on their devices and reading about information that they could use when it comes to food. I've got free newsletters. I've got free master classes. You know, just have people just come to my website, Dr. William Lee, Dr. William Lee, L -I .com, mm -hmm. or look up, look for me on Instagram, uh, Twitter, and you can actually follow. I, I put out new information all the time uh, from cutting edge research that's coming out uh, on foods that actually can help fight cancer. Yeah, I've actually, I've really appreciated your, your kind of YouTube shorts um, where you're like in the farmer's market and going, yeah, let's, let's wander over here and see what they've got. You know, and you, and you talk about it's, it's really uh, feels interactive and, uh, and useful. And I can tell you are deep in the, the current research, which I know at the tip of that iceberg of, of trying to be deep into it, not having a technical medical background. And so I can imagine, uh, how, how far you go on a weekly basis. Exactly. And I will make sure to link to everything you just referenced below so that people uh, can just click and go because there's a lot of great resources out there. Great. Well, it's really a pleasure for me to talk about this because, again, this is the kind of information that I realized, and, you know, and uh, I think on the last tape we talked about video, we talked about um, why I got into this because my cancer mm. patients always ask me what I should be eating and I didn't yeah. have the answer. And so you know, I, I'm real. I think it really important now for to be able to try to get that information out there. Your doctor might or might not be giving it to you, mm. okay. But when it comes to drugs, you need a prescription. When it comes mm. to food, you do it yourself. And by the way, another easy tip that I do is, you know, if you have my book, I always tell people this is the cheat. Take a get my book. Take a sharpie. Go straight for the tables that have all the foods. Just trust yep. me, I've already done all the heavy lifting for you um, to make sure that they're, they belong on there and start circling the foods that you already love. And then take your cell phone and take a picture of that page with the, that you sharpied, that you circle with the Sharpie. Next yep. time you're in the store, you're trying to figure out what you should buy, open up your photos and take a look at what you circled. And then that's kind of your yep. shop. Here's your cheat sheet. You know you like it already. Exactly. And now you know what that's doing to support your health. Exactly. That's awesome. Great, great recommendation. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. All right. Perfect. All right. You ready to dive into the last one? Sure. Okay. Perfect. Let's go. All right, everybody. We are back with Dr. Lee. Uh, in this video, what I really want to do is um, just kind of understand him as a person uh, uh, and, and dive into a little bit of his backstory what led him to this field that, that he's been in and influenced for many, many years. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited for this conversation. Dr. Lee, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jameson. Um, listen, my backstory began long before I went to medical school. Hmm. Uh, I was in college and I was um, a science major. Uh, I always knew I wanted to be, go into medicine and I always loved science, but I, it's the thing that really excited me was where where is the change going to come from where's the ch mm. where where's hope going to come from and you know to hope turn hope into reality this is where the promise of science has been and yet i looked all around and i realized that you know there's a lot of great scientists and a lot of great research that was being done most of it was helping the librarian by just adding more things onto the bookshelf as sure. opposed to things that were helping people and that's really something that i really wanted to do is to get involved with something using science that could help people so fast forward, um, uh, 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 after college, I did a gap year and I 
wanted to explore how um, history and culture inform people's food choices. And I was very interested in looking at, I mean, long before there were pharmaceuticals, there was food. And if you go all the way back into the, you know, ancient history, you know, like yeah. Hippocrates, the time of Hippocrates, the father of medicine, they didn't have any penicillin around. Well, so when somebody was sick, what did the father of medicine actually prescribe? Like that was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I went to Europe and I actually studied, you know, from historians and uh, like, what was the, what, what did they do back then? And, uh, and then where are the remnants of that, that practice into everyday life? And it turns out that, you know, a lot of the things that you see in these uh, Mediterranean food cultures in Italy and Spain and Greece and the south of France and Turkey, they had their roots when it comes to thinking about healthy eating, the combinations, the herbs, the spices, the seasonality, all dates all the way back had their long tendrils, their roots going all the way back to those ancient times. And then I was really interested in embedding myself into a place that actually had where people actually lived a 16th century lifestyle. Yeah. It turns out that in northeastern Greece, there is actually a peninsula of monasteries called Mount Athos, where people still live a 16th century lifestyle. Wow. At the time there was no running water, no electricity. Mm -hmm. People just lived off the land. So I went there mountain climbing and because you can get to climb up the, mount the mountains to get to the monasteries at the top. Like they're all like eagle's nests and, yeah. um, and really try to study how they stay healthy. And it was really, really fascinating journey for me because by the time I went back to medical school, so this was all before med school, yeah, I could never get out of my head that in a parallel universe, besides all the textbooks I was reading, all the drugs I was memorizing, all the diseases that I actually had to master, mm -hmm. and all the techniques and surgery and everything else that we, we had to uh, do in medical school, I could never get out of my mind that there's this parallel universe of people that actually had traditions that date back thousands of years. Yeah. And I always felt that there's got to be some connection between these. The science today must help us understand better what the past, why people carry these traditions forward. And that's really how I began getting interested in food as medicine. Now, there's another parallel part of this where I was interested in um, efficiency. Like, I couldn't stand it that, you know, that there's all these billions of dollars spent for cancer research. And back in the 1980s and 90s, there was so little progress made in cancer research and that billions of dollars mm -hmm. were being spent. And I'm like, how could that be? You know, we mm -hmm. could spend the same amount of money and put a person on the moon a few times, put you man on the moon a few times, and yeah. we can't come up with a good treatment for cancer? Come on. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that it was time to maybe take a different approach. And so rather than do what re med medical researchers traditionally do, which is to look at a disease like cancer, pick out one aspect of it, like uh, like uh, epigenetics or whatever, mm -hmm. okay, or, or tyrosine phosphorylation, and then go way deep. So you take something an inch wide and go a mile deep with it. Mm -hmm. And you know then you kind of are disconnected from the rest of the real world. Right. Um, you become an expert and you write a paper and it goes onto the library shelves. And now we're back to where, you know, where I noticed like, wait, we're, 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 we're not doing anything for people. I thought maybe what we should be doing is not look at what makes cancers and other diseases different from one another. That's the inch wide mile deep. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe what we should be doing is taking a look at what makes diseases the same. Mm. What unified, what were the common denominators of disease? And that's what brought me to angiogenesis. Got because it. what I realized is that angiogenesis, which is how the body grows blood vessels, mm -hmm. is a common denominator of every healthy organ in the body. And when angiogenesis goes wrong, that's when actually uh, the, all these diseases, chronic diseases occur, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, blindness, arthritis, obesity. And so I realized here's you know a way that potentially we could um, find a process that if we pulled the bow back, we could send a single arrow through mm. all these diseases at the same time. And yeah. so that's really what led to my involvement in 42 FDA approved drugs and devices, but as I was looking at all these biotech successes, I realized that, you know, we were probably missing the biggest opportunity of them all, mm. which is to present, prevent disease in the first place. And if you're gonna talk about prevention, you can't talk about fancy expensive drugs. Mm. You gotta talk about something that's available, uh, that's inexpensive, that's accessible to everyone. And that's where food comes in. And then I 
really went came full circle to plug back my old observations about cultures and foods with the latest science with how we can actually complement you know everything that modern medicine has with everything that humans have had for thousands of years and that's our food yeah you really brought together that full background uh, uh, that's in a really unique way that's cool so what what does your um, your health regimen look like personally kind of how do you, how do you apply all this research and all this work you've done uh, to yourself right well you know you have to walk the walk if you're gonna talk the talk and one of the things that I can tell you first that might be reassuring to your viewers is that mm -hmm. um, I'm not an extremist. I'm not a vegan. Uh, I'm not a pescatarian. I'm not a keto only guy. I'm not a whole 30 person. Like I'm, I'm, I'm actually somebody who really appreciates food. I'm not omnivore. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that based on the science, um, here's what the body craves when it comes to health offenses. It craves plant-based foods. Okay. Mostly plant-based foods, whole plant-based foods, fruits, mm -hmm. vegetables, nuts, legumes, healthy oils, herbs, um, uh, and spices, all good stuff for you. And the ways that you prepare them can make a difference. And the good news is that the ways you prepare them tend to be the ways your grandmother prepared them, you know, um, sort yeah. of simple, not too fancy. Um, you, and you don't overcook your vegetables. Don't ruin them. Okay. Um, so, you know, we haven't gotten too far away from uh, something that anybody can actually do. I, you know, um, when I, I don't eat a lot of red meat, that's true that we, we do know that lots of red meat and, and, and processed meats actually are linked to um, bad cancer outcomes, bad, higher rates, rates of cancer and bad cancer outcomes. But you know what? Every now and then I'll have a little bit of red meat. I try, I do try to avoid processed meat. Um, and, uh, um, and I used to tell my patients this, by the way, that, look, um, life is for the living. Okay, you have to really enjoy your life. And if yeah. you really love is a piece of steak, I'm not. I'm definitely not telling you to go out and eat steak. You should eat mostly plant-based foods. But if that's something that really means something to you and you really savor it, I, I used to tell people, look, um, go out. Don't do it very often. Treat yourself every now and then to a really good steak. Don't have too yeah. much of it. And get a really great one. You know, this whole idea that you can use you know, um, these pseudo plant-based fake meats, okay, which is an ultra processed food to try to make it taste like meat. I would say, right. you know, learn to enjoy real plants. Yeah. And then every yeah. moment, you can really just eat the plants for what they are. Yeah. yeah. Um, cut down in your, you know, cakes and candies, cut down or cut out, um, cut down and count out your red meat. I don't drink a lot of alcohol. Seafood happens to be one of these things that um, I do enjoy. Um, uh, and, um, but you don't have to have a lot of it. Uh, most of the studies showing improvement in, uh, longevity, improvement in health, lower risk of cancer involve um, people who eat, um, uh, seafood a couple of times a week. Mm. And how much do you need to eat each time? Not a lot, about three ounces. How much is three ounces of seafood? It's about, uh, the amount of fish eggs, for example, or shellfish. That's the, about the size of a deck of cards, about the size of your Got pulp. It. Not yeah. very much. Yep. Okay. So you don't need to have a big hunk of anything. So, uh, and people who don't want to eat uh, uh, fish, take some dietary supplements for omega-3, marine mm -hmm. omega-3 fatty acids. That'll be the way to cover it. So, you know, I, I don't have a lot of extra added sugar. I don't have a lot of red meat. I cut m down or cut out most of those things most of the time. Um, um, and I eat mostly plant-based food. I try to go back to um, old traditions. So I'll have green tea. I, because I lived in Italy, I'll drink coffee every single day. That chlorogenic acid yeah, from organic yeah. coffee beans, it's a, it's a real great thing for your health. Um, and that's about it. You know, I, the, your body loves diversity. Hmm. Your health systems love diversity. So I, I'm, I, I always tell people, do not be a robot. You know how some of these strict diets only do this. Yeah, yeah. Your body doesn't like that. Your body likes you to switch it up. Try it out. Do something a little bit different. And I'm also a food explorer. So if I see something that I don't recognize or I read about a food that I'm like, you know, I've been around a little bit, but I've never seen that. I want to go back out and I want to check it out. I want yeah, to give it a try. Don't think about food as a chore. Shopping mm. as a chore. Think about it as an adventure. I love that. Yeah, I think that's that's a well-balanced perspective that uh, life is for living. 
and you got to balance that with with health so so don't eat a, a steak every day uh, but if that is something that brings you joy plan a special time to to have a steak you know i i, I appreciate that the balance that comes with that all right yeah. uh, go ahead and I, I was just gonna say the other thing that i do is i drink a lot of tea i mm. drink a lot of uh, green tea oolong tea different kinds of tea and actually there's quite a lot of research um uh you know matcha tea amazingly which is the entire yeah. tea leaf ground into powder actually kills breast cancer stem cells which hmm. there's no drug that can do that right, right. here you have yeah. mother nature with a beverage that actually is really great to, to drink so um you know i think this is why i follow the bouncing ball of science it's yeah. that it's always uncovering new exciting things got it yeah i appreciate that uh, do you ever play around with alternative sweeteners? So you said you lower sugar. Are there alternative sweeteners that you like or, or see? Yeah. Value? So, you know, um, I don't like to use refined sugar, so I try to cut down or cut out of that in my entire life. I, in fact, I very, very rarely encounter mm -hmm. refined sugars if I can help it. Um, so I want to sweet something. I will use a natural sweetener. I'll use a little mm -hmm. syrup. I'll use some honey. Um, agave syrup is okay as well. In every case, what I encourage people to do, though, if you're going to buy honey or maple syrup or agave or whatever, stevia, make sure you pick up the bottle and you're reading the um, ingredients because sometimes manufacturers, you know, the companies, well, the factories will throw all kinds of other things in it. Yeah. So you don't want to have those other things. Now, what about artificial sweeteners? You know that um, the old story about saccharin, which is the first artificial sweetener, Mm -hmm. um, uh, is really quite a scandalous story. Like in today's world, it would be on the news. You know, all the talking heads would be talking about it. But back, way back when, um, saccharin actually was an artificial sweetener present in all kinds of foods. And mm -hmm. and um, uh, and many legislators were addicted to it because it was so sweet. Um, and uh, it was out the calories. And okay. when the FDA looked at the data, uh, they, they did think that it was dangerous enough to actually put a warning that, saccharin might cause cancer. Okay. But when they tried to run it up the flagpole with the lawmakers, they basically were so addicted to it. They said, no way you're going <laughs> to put that label on it. Okay. Interesting. Today, that would be a scandal yeah. back in the yesteryear. It was just one of those things where the, the, the ruling party had the, had the rule of law. It would never stand today, but fast forward to today, many of those things, aspartames and, you know, all these other synthetic sweeteners, mm -hmm. um, some of them have been shown and so i don't know i think they're it's it, the research is so compelling but still underway can damage your gut microbiome mm -hmm. because you know why do we use them because we don't want the calories from sugar um so you, you drink it that goes down um we don't absorb it right they're they're non-nutritive right. sweeteners that go all the way down to our gut they're feeding our gut bacteria our gut bacteria our defenders okay they're up there waiting for your waiting for their meal and you're dumping artificial chemicals stuff that they can't use they can't use it and it actually poisons them mm -hmm. and that changes the gut microbiome and our inflammation goes up and our metabolism mm -hmm. goes haywire okay and in fact when our metabolism go haywire guess what we gain more weight so mm -hmm. ironically people who drink a ton of diet sodas actually gain more weight yeah so um i think when it comes to something as important as cancer don't take that chance. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend. I, I don't. I stay away from artificial sweeteners. Um, yeah. I, so I just think natural. Yeah. yeah, natural and unrefined. Exactly. You All got right, it. perfect. So uh, last last bit of of uh, information from you. If you were diagnosed with cancer tomorrow, what would you do? That's a big question. It is um, a big question. <laughs> what's the first? What's the first thing you would do? Let me clarify that. You know, I, I would say the first thing I would do is after panicking, feeling panicked, sure. I would probably try to clear my head with some meditation. Mm. And then what I would try to do is to start putting all the resources I have down so I know what a possible game plan might be. Mm. Now, I have an unfair advantage compared to many people because of the work that I actually do. Mm -hmm. um, so on the treatment side, I would find a really good oncology team. Uh, I can, I, I mean, as I talk, I'll, I'll give you some tips. I, I, your, your, your listeners will actually get some tips from me. I never count on just one famous medical center. 
Mm-hmm. I want to put together the team of people and they could be great people all around the world to be part of my team. Okay. I don't need to be just prescribing. I want them to be advising and mm-hmm. give good input. And I want to be the final CEO of my own care. So I need somebody to do the guidance of the treatment, but I might not agree with everything. And so I want somebody that can also be willing to play ball with yeah. the team, number one. Number two, what I know today, I would have that tumor biopsied or removed by surgery. Um, and I would have a normal vial of my blood drawn and I would send it to a laboratory that can sequence the entire human mm-hmm. genome of the tumor and the entire human genome of my healthy cells in my blood. And then I want that person, that, that's, that, that laboratory to have our artificial intelligence to go back and forth and back and forth mm-hmm. to find only the mutations that are present in the tumor and not the normal. Ah, okay. Then I want to take that information and I want to actually compare it to a global database of every drug that's out there mm-hmm. that might be useful for me to hit the unique mutations in that tumor. Then, and of course, get, get the right treatments. And then actually yeah. what you actually do, and this is a little bit of science fiction that is just starting to be science fact, mm. the clinical trials going on this now. You can take those tumor specific mutations and you can actually create a peptide vaccine out of yes, them. Yes, I've heard of this inject them under your skin and in in the future we'll be able to vaccinate ourselves against our own cancer yeah so it's incredible incredible it's, research it is thin air stuff and of course then i would you know also look at the food and i would look mm-hmm. at the uh, other lifestyle aspect as a, as well but you know I, I think that you know cancer is such a significant event in mm-hmm. our lives um that you know like for me i don't pull any punches but i would start yep first by trying to stay calm. Yeah, I appreciate that. Step one is breathe, right? Step one is y- you are panicking and that's okay. Yeah, it's reasonable, but we gotta, we gotta find some calm and find some, you know, whether and, that's prayer, meditation. Yeah, and, and by the way, I would look for, because they're out there now, success stories, mm. things that you didn't think, think would happen. I'll, I'll tell everybody one that I think is worth just knowing about. Um, former US President Carter, Jimmy Carter, Mm-hmm. oldest living president uh, that we've ever had. I think he's 99. Mm-hmm. Um, after he retired from his presidency, was um, doing something amazing. He was building homes for people that didn't have shelter, yeah. habit for humanity. And he was out in the Georgia sun getting a ton of ultraviolet radiation. He developed a melanoma that spread to his liver and his brain. Mm-hmm. And at the time, like that's malignant melanoma that's metastasized to the brain. Like that's game over. Yep. And President Carter had withdrawn from public life. He had written his own obituary. He had, oh. you know, he was, he was, he had made peace with his maker and he was ready to go. But he got involved in a clinical trial for immunotherapy. Hmm. Um, uh, you know, uh, his last service to, you know, society. And guess what? It worked. And wow. the immunotherapy, which is called pembrolizumab, hmm. Detruda, actually wiped out that dry race like my mom had yeah yeah wiped out everything and here he is today still an elder statesman you know caring yeah. about how to make the world a better place so when you start looking at success stories like that you know and all you got to do is google if you're looking for anybody's looking for success stories just put immunotherapy complete responder mm. okay that's code for cure and you'll find the stories everywhere and i think that you know for somebody to help you not panic Okay. Uh, well, help you not panic. You want to meditate or pray, whatever it's going to calm you. But to really, and you got to organize yourself. But to give your give yourself a beacon of hope, because I think that's really important. Take a look at those case studies that are modern of yeah. people who are surviving unsurvivable odds, previously yeah. unsurvivable odds. They are snatching victory from the jaws of defeat every single day. You can find somebody like that. You know that you can swim to shore. Yep, absolutely. I think that's that is great advice, uh, and part of why we are here you know, at, at the Cancer Box is to to give some of those stories and and to connect with with some experts that uh, that can bring hope. Uh, it's a great job that you guys are doing. I think it's so important for the cancer community. 
right, well, thank you, Dr. Lee, for being with us for this final video. Um, all your information is down below for anyone who's watching this and wants to follow up with you, uh, learn more from you, masterclasses on your website, your Instagram is, is fairly active, your YouTube's fairly active. And so we'll make sure all of that's there because uh, you are a great person to have on anybody's team. Thank you, Jameson. It's a pleasure to be on.